It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the second and last lecture given in this year's interfaith lectures in the Humanitas program. My name is Johannes Sachuber and I am the director of that particular program. I also teach modern theology in the Faculty of Theology and Religion and I'm a fellow at Trinity College which is partly hosting these events. A very particular welcome, of course, is due to our speaker, Dr. Rowan Williams. Dr. Williams spoke last week, for those of you who weren't there, on faith, force, and authority. Does religious belief change our understanding of how power works in society? He used that opportunity to develop a number of deeply theological ideas about power and how they should change or influence the way we look at the operation of or the role of religious institutions and their relationship with political authority. His topic today leads on from there, well I assume we'll know in a moment, um, and the title is Faith and Human Flourishing, Religious Belief and Ideals of Maturity. And now, without further ado, I hand over to the man whom to hear you've come, Dr. Williams. We very much look forward to hearing you. Thank you. Once again, my very grateful thanks for the invitation to be here and to deliver these lectures. They've given me an opportunity not so much to think about interfaith issues, as usually understood, but more to think about fundamental issues in how we define, how we understand religion itself, and how we understand something about the religious personality. And that's the link I want to try to develop this afternoon. Moving on from the discussion which I initiated last week about the nature of power, to think about how that impacts on basic models of religious identity. Because if the reflections I shared last week on power, what it does and doesn't mean in the religious context, were anything like accurate, then there are some reasonably clear implications for how we think about religious identity, both individual and corporate. I suggested last week that we systematically made mistakes about the nature of power when we tried to apply that language in the setting of religious belief. I suggested that the notion of a deity with unconditional power is all too easily turned into a vastly magnified version of what I would like to have for my own liberty and my own, self my own sense of control. But that also within the categories and vocabulary of traditional religiousness, there were a number of factors pulling against that distortion, suggesting that the essence of talking about divine power was something rather more like the freedom to let the other be, the freedom expressed in creation, the ultimate power that has no anxiety, no rivalry, no territoriality. And in the course of that, noted that for classical Abrahamic faiths, as well as in some ways even more for others, the divine is not an item inside the universe nor, for clarification's sake, is the divine an item outside the universe in a spatial sense. We're talking about something of another order. Now, quite often, religious identity 
is understood from within and without as having rather a lot to do with what philosophers, moral philosophers call heteronomy. That is the imposition of law, convention, norms from outside, from the other. And thus, religious identity is seen as having a very great deal to do with repression. To be religious, on that account, is to be subject to another's will, and therefore to be called upon to make dramatic and consistent self-sacrifice. You won't need me to elaborate the ways in which that has been abused, distorted, and used for anti-human purposes across the centuries. But the point is that if that account is correct, if that is what religious identity is about, then the two items in my title, religion and human flourishing, don't very easily belong together at the end of the day. On the other hand, if the sketch I offered last time of how we might, as religious people, understand power is correct, then the picture is more complex. And what I intend to do this afternoon is to try to spell out the implications of conceiving divine power in a certain way in relation to what might be the marks of a religiously shaped human maturity. If divine power is the absolute freedom to bring the other into being without fear, without rivalry, without anxiety, then it would make no sense if human flourishing could only be achieved at the expense of God. It would make no sense if to be human were somehow to take some territory, some meaning, away from the meanings of God. That would only be the case if God were competing with us within the territory of the universe. Think of power in another sense, and that doesn't follow. So there must be some way of spelling out a religious idea of maturity and flourishing. And I'm going to suggest four lines of development here. Four themes which might suggest some of the things that are around as we seek to offer a definition of human maturity religiously informed. The themes are these. First of all, how we handle dependence and autonomy. How we handle dependence and autonomy. Secondly, the education of passion. I'll explain a bit more what I mean by that. The education of passion. Thirdly, the taking of time. And fourthly, the acceptance of mortality. Handling dependence and autonomy, educating the passions, taking time, accepting mortal mortality. So to the first, dependence and autonomy. Autonomy is very much an accepted ideal of modern and late modern culture. And it's perhaps a little bit too much of a cliché, though you often hear it from some religious people, that regarding autonomy as a supreme value is somehow mistaken. I don't want to overdo that. But I do think that there are issues in how we talk about, how we understand autonomy. Dependence is, after all, a condition of human life in certain senses. Importantly, inescapable. The long latency period of the human young, the phenomenon of language, the relative physical vulnerability of the human organism in its environment, all of these things build in to our distinctive human experience, a character of inescapable receiving formation by. To suppose that we are our own authors 
is to try and escape from some of these dimensions of our humanity. Negotiating what it means to be dependent is part of being human. The moral problem that has always surrounded this has been that very often when people talk about the need to accept dependence, they mean you need to accept your dependence on me or some equivalent of that. That's to say it's about inequality, imbalance within the human world. But that doesn't absolve us from trying to make sense of what it is for us to be receivers as well as creators. And what some have called the illusion of self-creation is a serious and vexing problem in how we understand the development of the human psyche. That remarkable and rather controversial writer Ernest Becker in an earlier generation wrote extensively about what he calls the project of self-creation <coughs> and how pr prolonged beyond a certain developmental stage it becomes the source of all kinds of pathologies. And he quotes Kierkegaard's definition of demoniac rage, an attack on all of life for what it has dared to do to one, as a manifestation of defiant self-creation, the anger of the would-be self-creator when the world and the self prove not, after all, to be under the control of the will. Now, the position of religious faith is, to generalize, of course, that all of us share one fundamental form of dependence, which is our dependence on divine liberty. We are here because there is an act which we echo, participate in, reflect, however you want to put it an act of divine initiative in virtue of which we are here at all. And so for us to be ourselves, the acknowledgement of that level of dependence is very importantly part of what sets us free because it acquaints us with what is true about us. We depend on an act that is not ours, that is not us. In its Christian version, this has some very specific colouring. We are, as Christians, encouraged to think of ourselves as growing into not simply the divine life in general terms, but that particular form of divine life represented by the Word, the Son, the offspring of the eternal source. We are adopted into a relationship of dependence to the one that Jesus calls Abba, Father. Our human identity therefore becomes one in which we both acknowledge in prayer our dependence on the gift that sets up not only our being but our renewed being in Christ and in acknowledging that dependence we are empowered to do the work of God, to be in Christ, however you might want to phrase it, in the various idioms and metaphors that the New Testament provides for us. It's about an authority which emerges from yielding not to an alien will, but to an affirming source. Yielding not to an alien will, but to an affirming source, recognizing that I am here because there is an act which wills me to be and affirms my being. So I do not have to be my own origin. I do not have to try to be a self-creator. There is a level of affirmation bringing me into and holding me in existence which I do not have to work for. And that relates back once again to some of the observations I was making last week about divine power and how a robust sense of what that means could deliver us from the anxiety of trying to keep God happy. But that's another story. 
So, in this first area of handling dependence and autonomy, one of the proposals of religious faith and religious language is that we are empowered, emancipated, to exercise the transforming energy we can exercise by acknowledging our dependence on an unconditional source of affirmation. I've given the version of that which is particularly associated with Christian language and Christian doctrine. We could spend longer on what that means in other religious contexts. But the theme in various guises runs across confessional boundaries to a significant degree. I'm not, I should add in brackets, suggesting that all religions are saying the same thing, but attempting to note and tease out some of those things which characterize a religious form of identity or self-understanding. And so to my second overarching theme, the education of passion. Now, passion in both Christian and Buddhist usage has some very specific associations. It's not simply a matter of emotion or instinct. The passions, as analysed and discussed, particularly in the ascetical literature, say, of the 4th to the 8th century, in the Christian world, and indeed much longer in the Eastern Christian world, the passions are those disturbances of the proper or fruitful condition of the self associated with inappropriate response to outside stimuli. Prodded and stimulated into life by the environment we're in, we can, says the great Evagrius at the end of the fourth century, we can respond in a variety of ways, some human, some diabolical, and some divine. A human response, pragmatic and exploratory, a diabolical response which seeks to master an environment and turn it solely to the purposes of the ego, a divinized response which regards what is around us in its own right, in its own dignity, not seeking to make it serve our private ends. So passion is the diabolical response. It is that response to an environment which is concerned simply to own and absorb, which is incapable of seeing what is in its own right, in its own dimensionality. And there are a number of ways in which uneducated passion can confirm our unfreedom, our moral and spiritual slavery. It's quite tempting to lift from our shoulders the burden of intelligent choice by naturalizing our motivations, by saying, these are the impulses I have, and therefore they need to be fulfilled. I don't need to reflect on them, assess them, discern them, choose between them. There they are. And lifting the burden of choice by appeal to an unexamined instinctual life is one of the obvious temptations we face there. And it can find its more contemporary forms in various versions of neurological determinism. I don't really choose. This is what happens in me. I don't act. Things happen. But along with that, we can assume, with unexamined, uncriticized passion, we can assume this absolute givenness of our needs and desires gives us, as selves, a solid agenda which potentially has to be defended against others. And so buys back into that system of rivalry, zero-sum gaming, and so forth, which we talked a little about last week. So that if I had to try and sum up what the word passion means in the classical Christian tradition, it seems to me to designate two things. 
the uncritical affirmation of the ego and the positioning of that ego in a state of struggle and rivalry. The uncritical affirmation of the ego, the positioning of the ego in a state of rivalry and contest. Major religious traditions, and I mentioned particularly Buddhism and Christianity here, offer both a diagnosis of passion and a pedagogy, a way of educating passion, not eradicating, but understanding. And that understanding has a lot to do with discerning what this life of passion serves, what its goals and products are. So by putting our reflex passionate responses to the world under scrutiny, we may find better what it is that those reflexes are aiming at and perhaps understand better how to reroute some of their energy away from the world of contest, struggle and rivalry. When Christians in that classical period of spiritual reflection between the 4th and the 8th century talked about apathia as the Christian ideal, I don't need, I'm sure, to underline for you that that does not mean apathy. It doesn't even mean the total absence of this instinctual life. It means, rather, that state in which you are aware of your reflexes and your responses in such a way that you can think through them, sense your way towards a goal that is not purely self-protective or acquisitive. And there's a good deal in the tradition about the proper use of passion, sometimes to undercut other sorts of passion. You can find there are some responses whose force, energy, or even relative violence can be deployed to knock other selfish, instinctual behaviours off course. But that's to go into more detail than I want to discuss here. The point is, there is a diagnosis, there is a pedagogy. There is the possibility of being aware of how one responds and the possibility of intelligently reshaping that response. Turn to the Buddhist thought world, and of course the categories are dramatically different, and yet some of the issues are still around. For the Buddhist, release comes when you recognize the totally conditioned character, not only of your responses, but of every act, mental and physical, in which you are involved. The beginning of wisdom is to dissolve the solidity of self feeling speech and thought in order to create a different kind of space within the world which in at least some traditions of Buddhism shows itself in what we call compassion. So <clears throat> the scrutiny of the passions and the education of the passions becomes a second area in which religious identity has something distinct to say about human identity appears as a distinct form of human identity characterized by practices and images which, rooted in specific narratives, nonetheless have some parallels in the way that they work. Now my third area may be rather less obvious, <clears throat> taking time. But I'd want to suggest that attitudes to time and the passage of time are deeply characteristic of distinctively religious behavior. People of faith do things with the calendar. As you know, one of the easiest default settings, if in doubt as to what to teach in religious education in schools, is to teach children about festivals. And although that can occasionally be anecdotal and unhelpful, behind it is a not completely faulty instinct that how religious communities spend their time is a serious and central theme. Time is not undifferentiated. 
its passing is marked in ways that are thought to be symbolically significant. So the passage of time becomes not just a trajectory of acquisition, acquiring property, acquiring power, acquiring security. The passage of time comes to be about the repeated accumulation, as you might say, of meaning. Returning to symbolic resources to rediscover aspects of the universe you inhabit, aspects of yourself, to reconnect specific ongoing experience with steady, regular, or rhythmical patterns laid out in the language and the practice of a religious community. You keep going back to the practices, the stories, the celebrations, the commemorations. And time, therefore, becomes neither simply cyclical nor simply linear. It moves, you change, at the same time there is something to which you return to rediscover and enlarge the understanding acquired in the passage of time. But all of that adds up, of course, to dissolving any idea that time is a limited commodity, or indeed any kind of commodity, which has to be squeezed as hard as possible in order to keep the trajectory of acquisition going. Time becomes a complex and rich gift. It becomes the medium in which we not only grow and move forward, but also constructively return, resource, literally resource ourselves. And there are deep implications within that for how we approach human work and human well-being, and how we understand and how we cultivate a fruitful rhythm in action and human engagement. Increasingly, one of the marks of a fully and uncompromisingly secular environment is, of course, the notion of undifferentiated time. There are, for mature late capitalism, no such things as weekends. The problem with that kind of secularism is not so much the denial of the existence of God as the denial of the possibility of leisure. <laughs> That's to say, for a particular mindset, acquisitive and purpose-driven in a specific way, the passage of time is precisely the slipping away of a scarce, valuable commodity every moment of which has to be made to yield its maximum possible result. So you can't afford to stop. That kind of, and I trail my coat a little, that kind of secular understanding of the passage of time is perhaps one of those areas where there is most open collision between a fundamentally religious and a fundamentally anti-religious mindset. And I think that's one of the untold stories of our time. We imagine, quite often, don't we, that the really fundamental collisions are around metaphysics or ethics. Perhaps there's another area at least as important, which is how we approach the time we are in, the time we spend and indeed the time we waste. And these three themes so far, <clears throat> autonomy, passion, time, the theme of the struggle for autonomy, the self-creation project, the seduction of unexamined or uncriticized passion, and our desperation about time, all those, of course, converge with anxiety about death and reluctance to accept mortality. Our mortality tells us that every project we have is limited. There is something non-negotiable about that absolute limit. There is an ultimate challenge in that to any fantasy or fiction of the all-powerful ego. 
And it is resistance to mortality, the denial of death in the title of Ernest Becker's best-known book, The Denial of Death, that takes us back towards the pathologies of power, which we looked at last week, power as the effort to deny not only limit, but the ultimate limit of death. That's Ernest Becker. So the knowledge of mortality runs through all those other themes in one way or another, because the denial of that knowledge of our mortality returns us to the false, the destructive models of power, which we were looking at last week. And the characteristically religious response includes, at least, it's not the whole of it, but includes a balance of attention to the immediate and resignation to the long term. Redeem thy misspent time that's past, live each day as if twere thy last, says the Anglican hymn. That's to say, the attention to what is immediately to be done, along with acceptance of long-term limit and long-term ending, is what we're asked to do, what we're asked to engage in. It's not about a wavering level of attention to the present for the sake of an imagined future, though that's the way it's sometimes been treated. We're going to die, so we'd better have a plan. It's not quite what it's about. Well, those are my four areas proposed as some of the characteristics of a religious human identity, a flourishing human identity shaped by religious considerations, shaped by a conviction about a liberty on which we depend, convictions about the possibility of clarification by honesty and discipline of our instinctual life, shaped by a readiness to see the passage of time as symbolic and complex, not just an undifferentiated continuum which has to be filled, and shaped by an acceptance of the limit of mortality. Non-disabling dependence, a freedom for self-critique, patience and literacy in ritual, and lack of anxiety in the face of death. The absence of any or all of these is one of the contributory factors in dysfunctional human communities and dysfunctional human individuals. Those who are rebelling against any form of dependence, those who cannot cope with the notion of self-question or self-critique, those who wish to treat time, as I say, as something which has to be filled up, those who are in denial of their mortality. But of course, having said all that, those four crucial, what should I call them, seasons of the life of the spirit, are all of them capable of being distorted and misrepresented within the religious idiom within religious rhetoric and system building. And if we're going to talk about those four as positive things, it's not unimportant to be aware of the negativity that can also be triggered. So just to run through them briefly, what I call non-disabling dependence can be replaced by infantilism by love of dependence for its own sake, divorced from any notion that dependence enables or liberates. Institutions and authorities, religious institutions and authorities, are, in case you haven't noticed, capable of very high degrees of infantilization of communities. And sometimes that is welcome to those for whom non-disabling dependence is rather hard work, as of course it is. Instead of 
the critical and constructive approach to passion suggested by <clears throat> some aspects of the classical tradition, we can, of course, take refuge in emotional repression. We can elevate the will over the feelings, which is not at all what the classical discussion of passion is about. We can elevate the will over the feelings in the hope that somehow dangerous or uncontrollable or unpredictable instincts can be controlled by our decision. We can turn the, again, creative and constructive use of the rituals of time into ritualism and the fear of change. Instead of a sense of the sacredness of a time that has given us for constant cumulative rediscovery. And of course, religious language is more than capable of renewing and intensifying anxiety in the face of death. Partly by certain kinds of talk about divine judgment. You have every reason to be afraid of death because of what's coming after. Or, of course, it can encourage you to ignore the present for the sake of a heavenly future in a consolatory and dishonest frame. So all of those aspects of religiously shaped human flourishing are capable of being, in effect, turned on their head and distorted in ways like those. And if we are to avoid that kind of distortion, that kind of turning upside down of the what I believe to be the essentially constructive and flourishing models I've been trying to outline, we need, we need, I think, to go back to some of the fundamental points that I was hinting at in the first lecture. Points about power, divine power, and about the difference of God. That is the fact that God is not a competing item inside the universe. If that is anything like clear, it will become, for example, a good deal easier to see that dependence on God is radically unlike yielding to someone else who is like you. Depending on God is radically unlike losing a struggle for power, losing your control, losing your autonomy. To be dependent in that radical sense on another human subject is to be in deep danger of repressive, dehumanizing patterns of relation. To depend on God, I believe in the context I've suggested, is something unlike that. Likewise, freedom from passion, apathia, is not giving up what is natural for the sake of the supernatural, but learning a perspective on oneself, learning the right and wrong exercises of the will in this, identifying some of the ways in which self-oriented responses to the world prevent us seeing what is there, and so allowing our vision, in some sense, to be cleansed. Imagery which is as, as potent in the Buddhist as in the Christian world, and in many, many other contexts also. So that getting our perspectives a little clearer on the grammar of God, how we talk about God as God, that is not only to do with clarifying, purifying what we say about God, it is also, crucially, a purifying of what we find to say about ourselves. To see oneself afresh in this light and to learn the grammar of talk about God belong absolutely and inseparably together, which is why I've offered in these lectures a pairing of reflections on the power and transcendence of God and reflections on what it means for human beings to flourish. And so if we are to recover any sense of religious commitment being more than just having a set of mental positions, usually seen as irrational mental positions, we need to refocus a bit on how we are as religious people speaking of 
human flourishing? What is the human face that is being uncovered in the practices of faith? What's the human face that's being uncovered in the practices of faith? It's a question increasingly posed about the habits of our contemporary world. Richard Sennett's important work on the human and psychological effects of capitalism has posed the question, what kind of human being does current global market practice presuppose and what kind of human being does it nurture? Adding, of course, is that the kind of human being we want to be caught in a train carriage with? But the question is the same for any religious practice, habit, or system. What kind of human face is being uncovered? What sort of humanity is being educated, nourished, developed in this context by this language? And that is where, of course, the criticism of religion by those who don't share its commitments is of such essential importance. It is very important for people of any faith, to put it very simply, to know what they look like in the eyes of others. That may not be a fair or reasonable or comprehensive picture, but it is important to see what face is actually being uncovered in the practices of faith, rather than simply hoping for the best. So that exercise, that challenge of trying to see what a mature human subject might look like who's been shaped by this style of living, thinking, and imagining, that becomes both for the well-being of religious communities and for the well-being of the human community a real focus, I think, for energy and reflection. I suspect that we, and by we I mean people of faith, don't often enough ask with seriousness the question, <coughs> what does our humanity look like? And even if we do, perhaps don't wait long enough for the answer. But this afternoon, what I've been trying to do quite simply is to put before you some of those things which I believe make for human flourishing in the fullest sense, which are nourished and encouraged and enabled by certain assumptions in faith. I said earlier that I didn't want to go down the road of saying all faiths are saying the same thing. There are ineradicable doctrinal disagreements which can't be glossed over. There are cultural forms of embeddedness which we can't ignore. And yet, I do believe there is something to be said for a dialogue among the faiths which looks very hard at the processes of human formation, which asks together about the kind of human face that the habits of faith uncover. And that is the exercise, the possibility, that I'm trying to sketch for you today in the hope that it might make some sense of how in the work we are bound to do for a common humanitas, how we shall go forward and find some creativity for ourselves as people of faith in a world which is notably characterised by some of those pathologies that Becker sums up as the denial of death. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much indeed for your lecture. There's plenty of time for questions and comments, so please make yourself known. I do hope we have mics somewhere. Um, ah, yes, there they come. Okay, well, the first one from the gentleman in the fourth row. <coughs> I 
I love how you have positioned um, us in terms of in relationship to God, which you did in your previous lecture before yesterday, and you showed how it all together. And, um, one of the things that struck me in your first lecture was how you talked about getting out of the way. And um, I suppose my, my question um, is around how you see the relationship with God um, when this maturing has taken place, if you like, or, or, or when we've actually sort of incorporated or, or acknowledged um, this. I mean, this. Because there's a lot of, like your four points, for example, um, uh, a non-disabling dependency is, is, is a very, um, it, you know, it's a, it's a still autonomy. You know? um, there's still a lot of passion. Um, um, there's still um, a choice being made in terms of time. And the acknowledgement of mortality is an embracing of our life, and and so the uh, the relationship with God is often to acknowledge, and then to and then to sort of recognise that okay, um, uh, you know this improves human flourishing, but there seems to be a point that what is my relationship to God when that is beginning to mature, and how do you see the role of the human being and God as an integrated I'm tempted to begin the answer by saying, well, I'll tell you when I've grown up, <laughs> because I have to guess a bit about what it's like for... I thought you might speculate. <laughs> I can speculate. I've, I'm fortunate enough to have seen some people who seem to, to have grown into it. And the speculation, I think, would go a bit like this. Um, the relationship with God as it develops becomes less and less a relationship with a simply imagined other like, like myself. More and more a sense of communion is the only word we have, which is not absorption but the sense of the other who resides in, in oneself. <coughs> Something to do with what um, Christian contemplatives often talk about, which is one's self becoming right, the place where the second person of the Trinity happens. You, know, you, you are that, that locus for the prayer of Jesus in the spirit to, to rise up. Um, and that, the intimacy that belongs with that is and isn't like the intimacy we have in human communion. It's, it's a hint of something further, which our vocabulary is not very good at handling. But as that evolves, I'm thinking here especially of somebody like St. Teresa of Avila, um, who in her account of the seven stages of contemplative growth, makes it very plain that somewhere near the end of the story, <clears throat> you are really losing a lot of orientation because the sense of a God who's simply there to be talked to becomes much harder to get at. And the sense of energy or pressure within much stronger, which means, as she says, you, you become both Mary and Martha. There isn't a a gulf between the time you spend opening up to God and the time you spend in practical, prosaic service. That they're not easily pulled apart. And that doesn't mean you go around in a sort of cloud of mystical ecstasy. <laughs> it means that a lot of the, um, the boundaries you've taken for granted begin to get much more problematic. And yet, the sense that emerges is of a set of human relations and human services ooh, which, which would be unthinkable without the relatedness to God that lay at their root, and yet those things aren't in, in contest or competition. And Teresa helps me guess, let's say, what that might look like. 
Um, there's a question here in the third row, Professor Hampson. Thank you for this lecture. Um, just need to say the following. Uh, on the one hand, I've heard Thomas Aquinas quoted as saying that God creates us not like a workman makes a chest, but like a singer sings a song, which seems to me exactly the kind of relationship you were talking about. Uh, and I noticed that Schleiermacher, at the beginning of the Christian faith, also has a sense of deep, you might say, dependence on God, which is not heteronomous, mm -hmm. as I read him. Um, and it seems to me that what these two theologians hold in common, at opposite ends of what one might think was the Christian spectrum of theologians, is that they start from a philosophical position in their theology, and they don't have a particularly anthropomorphic sense of God, and therefore they're both able to do this. Um, and it seems to me that the scanner in the works of the wonderful sense of human mature spirituality, which he presented us with this afternoon, is something which is central to all of the Abrahamic religions, namely revelation. Because as soon as you have revelation, then you start having a kind of heteronomy, because you've got a historical religion, and that there is a, a book which is authoritative, or a God who has revealed something. And by the same token, you have um, an, an anthropomorphic God, or one who is represented in anthropomorphic terms. So while I appreciate what you're saying, it seems to me that it doesn't fit well with Thank you, Daphne. Um, I th that's, I mean, that is a massive question, obviously, which I shan't be able to answer <laughs> adequately in a short response. But let me try and think aloud on this for a moment. Um, given that Thomas Aquinas did believe in revelation and somehow managed to put it together, you know, and as, as have others, um, Al Ghazali or Maimonides, likewise. Um, I think it goes something like this. St. Thomas, like other Aristotelians, believes that what we know, we know because of the kind of world we're in. We don't detach our minds and send them in search of transcendent truth elsewhere. We know because of the relations that develop within this world. Nothing is the in, in the intellect that isn't first in the sense, says Thomas. And I think that has something to do with this issue. For Thomas, when he talks about revelation at the very beginning of the Summa, he speaks, I think, quite significantly about how holy teaching is about those persons by whom divine revelation comes to us, meaning that the narratives of, in his case, the narratives of the biblical characters. Now, the way in which, therefore, God is believed by St. Thomas to reveal God's self is not by the intervention of a person out outside the universe, but by a sort of punctilia action by someone a bit like us, only bigger, but by the way in which particularly human lives, by opening up at a uniquely radical level, to the root of all things in the Trinitarian God, become carriers of a challenging, a transformative insight, a divine act. So I don't think one has to be as um, much doomed to anthropomorphism within the Abrahamic traditions as you might suggest. But to elaborate that would take longer. That's where I'd begin, at least, in, in the response. <coughs> um, there was a question, I think, yes, over there, and the, um, right there where you are, Sarah, the <coughs> gentleman in black. And behind the gentleman in black as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. The lady with the blue scarf. Next one. Yeah, I found the lecture um, um, very interesting, and I wanted to ask you some questions about it. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering whether you could Him the freedom 
Thanks. I'm, I'm glad you raised the question of judgment because I was aware of not um, doing justice to that in a passing remark. Um, while I think that there would be areas in which I, I take some issue with what, the way you've just put it in terms of God's freedom to end, I wouldn't dispute the centrality of judgment. Indeed, I assume throughout that the judgment of God, that is, the um, uncomfortable effect of our exposure to the truth of God, is one of those non-negotiable things we, as spiritual subjects, have to come to terms with, to be before the, the naked judgment of God, the truth of God, is to have one's own evasions and failures exposed without, well, I won't say without mercy, but without qualification. You know, we are shown in the light of God for what we are. That's the judgment which all of us are, I believe, summoned to. How one um, hooks that on with any precision to notions of the end of all things has never been straightforward. Even in Christian scripture, you can see just how complicated it is. And um, I take great comfort from the fact that Jesus says of that day and that hour, no one knows. <laughs> so, trying to make amends for a conscious overstatement in <laughs> what I said, I think I'd um, approach it in terms something like this. The anxiety surrounding death, understood as an anxiety about the limit to my projects and my proposals, understood as an anxiety about the ultimate loss of control, that is an anxiety which people of faith ought to be growing beyond. But the anxiety, not anxiety, the, um, let's say the proper apprehension of what it might be like to be confronted with the truth without defence is a proper apprehension. In that sense, the strand within Christian tradition of you know, reflecting on death as an ascetical exercise makes perfect sense to me. I just want to pull that apart from you know, the self-defensive anxiety of, uh, oh, death is, death is a nuisance. Um, as in King Lear, when Oswald, isn't it, is killed by Edgar at just the moment when he's going to become rich and famous. And he says, death, death, untimely death. Damn it, he was, he was just going to become all right, and now he <laughs> dies. And that the anxiety about death, which is about is the brick wall we meet, imagination, that's something we drop. The, um, whatever you want to call it, the sober apprehension, the, the godly fear, of what it might be to be exposed to the truth that we should be cultivating. Thank you so much. My question actually follows on from the discussion of Mati. Um, as you were speaking, uh, and picked up this wonderful set of ruminations on how humans as individuals and in collectives could cultivate their higher selves, if you will, I was struck that much of what you were describing, at least three out of the four elements, might have been uh, identified by Sigmund Freud, for example, or people working, not necessarily the Freudian paradigm, but in contemporary psychotherapy, to help people confront apprehension in a healthy way, develop themselves, confront death, confront pressure, cultivate healthy frenzy. I'm not sure about time. So then we're left with the question, what does faith do, or religion do, that therapy or other healthy processes of cultivating self themselves do not? Mm. Interestingly enough, that very question is one that Becker addresses at some length in The Denial of Death, and he's less confident about Freud's ability to handle it than I think you, you might be. But no, no. But, but Freud, Freud's an interesting case in point, um, because... Um, Freud's deeply tragic sense of the human, which to, to me is one of the greatest things about Freud as a, as a thinker, um, does at times, Becker and others suggest, make 
the, the non-disabling dependence side of it really quite difficult for him. And I think the two, the two areas of distinctiveness that I would want to flag up are first what I was saying about the non-disabling <coughs> dependence thing, that it is, for the person of faith, it's rooted in an act that is not ours, decisively not ours, that is the sense of being as bestowed, as given, that something um, gratuitous on which we rest, which is the free act of love in the Christian and Abrahamic context. And then you're quite right, the, um, the management of time is something which is not quite the same in these worlds, though I think a good therapist would no, no doubt say that the proper handling of your rituals is part of, of healing. So for me, it's, it's in that first characteristic that the, the distinctive thing comes in. And in a sense, the other things flow from that. So the sense of giftedness in existence. Well, that's very interesting. Um, I wouldn't at all mind talking about the education of rationality um, because <laughs> I, I do think we're, we're stuck with a particularly bloodless and mechanical view of rationality very often. Up until, I suppose, about the 12th century in Europe, reason was not so much a method of arguing as a capacity to attune to the order of things. So in the famous dispute between St. Bernard and Peter Abelard in the 12th century, Bernard's objection to Abelard is not so much that Abelard is exalting reason over faith as that Abelard is using a model of reason which Bernard doesn't recognize. Bernard wants to say, well, to be reasonable is to have this capacity to to know where you belong in the world to you know to sense your connectedness with the world and the orderliness of of God's creation and there is Abelard talking about levels of probability and argument and says that's that's not what it's about now Abelard is of course a hugely important figure in the development of scholastic theology and I'm not suggesting that I would back Bernard against Abelard, but Bernard is making there a very interesting point about the ways in which concepts of reason get thinned out as the centuries go on. So I think if I were talking about the education of reason, that, that's one of the points I might want to pick up. Um, but it's the language of the diagnosis and reshaping of passion that is probably rather more deeply entrenched in the Christian world. And what's interesting there, I think, is that the opposition you touched on between reason and passion is not the opposition that, that's at work in, let's say, an Evagrius. Passion is not opposed to reason. Passion is opposed to, to peace, even to nature. Sometimes our natural <laughs> functioning <coughs> is when the passions are not you know, pulling us this way and that and driving us to dominant and exploitative patterns of relation with the world. So it's always worth asking with words like reason or passion, what are people not saying when they're using them? And the reason passion thing as we've inherited on the whole from the 18th century doesn't work very well with, with the earlier religious framework. And of course, that vocabulary would be different again in um, a Muslim or Buddhist environment. I think if you looked at some of the ways in which um, at least some Muslim philosophy and jurisprudence evolves in the Middle Ages, you would see there again a, a concept of reason, which is not at all 18th century, unsurprisingly, and perhaps has more in common with, with St. Bernard.
Yes, um, Emma. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Um, while what you were saying about the very difference between our dependence on God and our dependence on human beings, uh, it seems to me that one of the things that is quite central to um, <coughs> Greek religious practice is having a very different attitude to how we treat other people and moving uh, into sort of models of interdependence. some way part of uh, somebody else wants to remain in that kind of relationship about passions and things. And I just want to hear more about how this relates to the sense of community and human interaction. Yes, well you you touch on something that um, that I really believe is utterly crucial in our understanding of what certainly Christian faith has to say about social relation, about the nature of human belonging together. In Christian scripture, the governing metaphor for the, the reassembled community around Jesus, the, the sort of renewed humanity, the governing metaphor is the body. That is to say, a metaphor in which you take for granted that every participant in this community has a distinctive and irreplaceable combination, um, contribution to make to the welfare of every other and of the whole. And it's that sense of an irreplaceable gift in each that, that to me, is one of the keystones of a proper Christian ethic. To respect the dignity or the liberty or the right of another human subject is not as well, just to accord them a status. It is to say there is some level at which I and others need the irreplaceable gift that is, that is there in this particular person. I think that's one of the implications of the way the metaphor of the body is developed. And so that, um, that particular way of coming at interdependence is, for me, certainly one of the distinctives about a, a Christian ethic. And again, I, I leave the question open as to how it works in other religious vocabularies, but that's, that's where I stand and where I, <coughs> where I find the, the uniqueness, sorry, unique, yes, the uniqueness of the Christian picture as against secular versions of togetherness or of rights or of dignity even. Something is given. Once again, it's a reflection or a, a, a facet of the fundamental bestowal that, that the believer is committed to behind and within all things. So it's one of the ways, I think, in which we, how should I say it, we can re-educate ourselves in understanding dependence when we understand interdependence and when we move rather away from the question, of, do I depend on somebody else or don't I? Well, I don't want to depend on anyone. Yes, but they depend on you in some important senses the whole um, endless kind of pass the parcel of <laughs> the gifts of the Spirit comes into play there. So thank you for raising that because the word is important, I think, and, and distinctive. The next question comes right from the back and then there's one um, at the other side of the room. <coughs> Hmm. Thank you. A really important point, that. Um, once again, I, my initial panicked response is to say, well, there's been an awful lot of quite serious Christian writers who don't seem to have found it a problem, so why do I? <laughs> but trying to address it. When we talk of the personal character of the Christian or Jewish or Muslim God, we are, I think saying what was expressed by some modern writers, saying that there is that about God which is at least personal. That is, that we cannot imagine, imagine, come back to the word, 
Um, we cannot imagine all of this making sense unless something like intelligence and something like love are what we're talking about. And the only models we have for talking about love and intelligence are personal. You know, they're related to our life as finite persons. That God is a person in the sense of being a member of the class of persons, let alone that God is three persons in the sense of being three members of the class of persons, Christian theologians have always been very, very wary of. That the personal qualities of liberty or love or intelligence can't be pulled away from how we talk or think about God. That's been axiomatic all the way through and I think remains um, remains axiomatic if you want to hold on to that notion of bestowal or creation. And that being said, you're then I think back with the traditional and familiar language of a Dionysius or an Aquinas or a Palamas saying the yes but. We can only say something like intelligence but we can't say exactly what we mean by that. We can say we can't think it without that being in the mix somewhere but not projecting a, you know, a clear picture of an intelligent individual. We use these adjectives as models, we qualify them Ian Ramsey's language back in the 60s, we have models, we qualify them, we qualify them and qualify them, hope they don't completely lose their content. And alongside that, the exposure to the imagelessness of God is simply a matter of constant practice self-questioning again, um, clearing out the projections, the self-serving models that we repeatedly draw in there. So a complex business, and always has been, and it's not going to get any easier, I think. But the two things, the two points where you, as it were, nail down the, the cloth are, on the one hand, there is no accurate image of God as God. We talk of Christ as the image of the Father, meaning that's, that's the particular bit of history where certain things come alive. We don't talk about reproductions or imitations. So, you know, we can't have an adequate picture. At the other end, knowing we can't avoid returning again and again to the language of love and intelligence to make sense of what we're talking about. We shuffle back and forth between those, I think, all the time. Uh, it was somebody, yeah. Yes. Um, I may be about to be horrendously contradictory, but do you feel there is any place for sort of suffering or negativity in human flourishing? <coughs> hmm. Yep, I mean, you're right, there, there is a sort of prima facie contradiction there, isn't there, to say um, flourishing includes suffering. <laughs> um, I suppose I'd want to come at that by saying it depends, whether you, it depends how static you want to be about it. Um, if you want to talk about, as a Buddhist or a Hindu, and many Christians want to talk about bliss as what we are made for, then I think, bluntly, that is a condition in which we are utterly at home with the reality of ourselves and, and our God. That, you know, that's it. But flourishing, as we use it about actual human lives lived in time, and I think this perhaps is the, the edge of your question, um, surely we would have to say that the sheer unevenness of human experience the inevitability of discovering certain things by failure rather than by success means that a life which overall we judge to have been a flourishing human life doesn't have to be devoid of negativity or suffering. Otherwise, we'd have a bit of a problem with the life of Jesus of Nazareth or Paul of Tarsus or Gautama or, you know, 
So maybe it's static and narrative that, that helps a bit with that. That makes some sort of sense. It's the uh, lady in the penultimate row, right in the middle. I was particularly interested in what you had to say about time. And I wondered if you could comment on the possibility of wasting time from a religious or a non-religious perspective. Happily, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> I do find myself quite often, if I'm, say, talking to um, secondary school students, trying to say, it could be quite important for you to know how to waste time. Now, you may think you don't need to say that to teenagers, but actually you do, in a very driven and unmerciful environment where more and more we pile requirements of performance onto young people. I think it's, it's important to say there are moments where you don't have to account for the time you're spending, where you can, in the old image, invite your soul. I wouldn't quite put it like that to sixth formers, <laughs> but seriously, moments when... There can even be constructive boredom mm -hmm. in the sense that it's important to stop trying to get on top of every moment. And because um, this is a bit counterintuitive for all of us anxious people, then either obsessional work patterns or hectic leisure patterns, want to make a, a bid to, to grab everything. And I think hectic, feverish leisure, if you can have such a contradiction, is as much of a problem in our culture as <laughs> obsessional, unrelieved, achievement-oriented work. And somewhere in between, there's, isn't there a, a kind of human time, humane time-wasting, <laughs> which we ought to be working on in some ways. So I, I think that there is a role for wasting time. And it's a pity, really, that we've inherited quite so much of that sub-Puritan mindset, which, while rightly saying you have to give an account for every moment you spend of your life, interprets that to mean you have to show your results for every moment of time you spend. I think it's perfectly imaginable to say to God on the Day of Judgment, whatever exactly that means, um, yes, that was a day I consciously and prayerfully wasted. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not let this be the last question. So there is the lady in the second, uh, <coughs> second row. Vulnerability, yes. Um, I touched on this a little bit last week, I suppose, in talking about, again, the right and wrong sorts of defenselessness. And I think what I'd want to say is that I don't want to um, absolutize or romanticize vulnerability in the sense that I say that the only or the best thing we can offer is our woundedness. <coughs> That's true at one level, but it can also be an uncomfortably self-focused thing. Mm -hmm. The vulnerability we offer, I think, in, in say, in ministry or whatever, <coughs> is not to say, look at my wounds or look at my weakness. It's to say, I am setting aside the consideration of my anxiety, my fear, my, my hurt. I'm setting that aside. Not denying it or romanticizing it. <coughs> but for this purpose, insofar as my um, woundedness could become an obstacle to listening, to engaging, I deliberately put it on one side, let, letting it inform my listening but not dominate my speaking. Mm -hmm. 
Let's see this time for one last question. Um, yes, the gentleman here. Um, <coughs> I think it's absolutely right that um, the attitude that says it doesn't matter what happens here because it's the afterlife, because I think that is a, a very dangerous approach, and it's certainly not one that's um, shared by the most serious Christian commentators over the centuries. But let's just pause for a moment on your first point. Um, I think the notion that we are judged not on our keeping of the rules but on something else is one that's already there in the Gospels, in a sense. Um, and just as Jesus in the Gospels is not saying ignore rules but understand that rules are about the kind of person you are becoming, then I think you know, that does run right through. It's St. John of the Cross in the 16th century who says, in the evening of our life, it will be on love that we are examined. So the conviction that there is beyond death, however we express that, that moment of confrontation with the truth, I think ought to make us, as I hinted, deeply conscious of the significance of every moment that passes because becoming more or less attuned to the truth is what happens moment by moment you know, in, in every encounter. It's possible for me to get a little bit further towards or a little bit further away from that fundamental um, all-defining honesty. And it's only in that way that I become the person <coughs> who finally sees God in the face. So I think a proper attitude to death and judgment is one that quite simply says, and the next 30 seconds are decisive, and the 30 seconds after that, and the 30 seconds after that. Don't take your eye off the ball. Look at what's in front of your eyes. That's where it starts. Um, if I can be sermonic for a moment, if I haven't already been, um, <laughs> I've sometimes said that what's going on in the temptation stories in the Gospels <coughs> is, at least in part, the devil saying to Jesus, take your eye off the present for the sake of, of the future. Take your eye off the real world in favour of the imagined world where I can give you all you want. And the refusal of the temptation is the affirmation that it's here and now, that the presence of God is encountered, the will of God is discovered, and our own humanity is shaped the next 30 seconds and the 30 seconds after that. Right, we've come to the end of our time and the end of this series, so it's time for me to say a few thank yous. Thank you, first of all, to all of you for coming and participating, especially those who've asked questions. Thank you in particular to the Institute for Strategic Dialogue and the Research Center in the Humanities, whose um, colleagues <coughs> did a lot of the groundwork to make these events possible. I should also mention Again, in particular, the Gerong Hermes Foundation for Peace and the Susan Steen Shiva Foundation, uh, whose generous donations made these series um, only possible. But most of all, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, um, we need to thank our speaker, uh, Dr. Williams, who's shared with us so many um, ideas in his lectures, but I think also in the way he responded to so many and such a wide range of questions, and I think he's given us all much to take home and to reflect further about. And so I'm sure you'll join me in thanking um, Rowan once again. <laughs> <laughs>